I know of only one guy in this world that can follow that up. He's a uh, popular person with the Astros community, a very good friend of Open Slips. Mr. David Duffett Woo! is going to be talking to us today about uh, what's going on in Astros. Thank you. Is that all working? Am I on? Right, yeah. Am I on? And you probably want to move it just a little bit. Just a little bit. Perfect. Yeah. How about that? Perfect. Okay. Pipe down, people. Alrighty. Okay. Well, great to see so many uh, familiar faces and some friends that I didn't make just yet. Uh, my name is David Duffett. Uh, I work with Digium to represent uh, the interest of the asterisk community with Digium and the interest of Digium with the asterisk community. And I came along to give you a little bit of an asterisk update. There's the Twitter name down there, D Duffett. Um, if you care to uh, tweet anything, then feel free to do that. Here's what we're gonna do. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about sharing and the community. I wanted to tell you a bit about asterisk 14 and 15. And it also came to my attention that in an audience of this nature, there may be people that touched asterisk many years ago and then moved on for whatever reason and don't know what's been going on. And so I wanted to bust a few asterisk myths that I hear around the place. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about the asterisk project. How does that sound? Is that okay? Great. All right, top clubs. Okay, by the way, if any of you believe in telekinesis, raise my hand. Okay, Perry, all right, stop it. Right. Okay, but before we do that, it's early on in the day, and so probably an opportunity to get to know each other just that little bit better with a quick bit of geometric testing. And this is very simple, do play along. All you have to do is pick your favorite shape out of that, okay? Out of those four. You're bound to have a favorite in there. So, has everybody made their choice? Just go with, don't, don't overanalyze this, just go with the first thing that comes along. Okay. Who are our triangle people? Do you want to put your hand up if you're a triangle people? Have a good look around at the other triangles. Nothing wrong with being a triangle. These are very ambitious and directed people. It's the shape. You know, they know where they're going and they've probably got a plan about how to get there. Uh, what about the detailed conscious? Oh, sorry. What about, what about the square people? <laughs> Any square people out there? Okay, well, there's nothing out there. Can I change my vote? <laughs> oh, it's, going, it's all going pear shape now. Okay, yes, these are the detailed conscious people. They're very precise. They like to colour up right into the corners. And what about the circle people? I would be a bit of a circle person myself. These are the people people. You know, they're into the code, but they can also talk to other human beings, which is a distinct advantage. And what about the squiggly lines? Yeah, have a quick hands up. Have a good look at the squiggly lines. By the way, Mark Spencer, creator of Asterisk, is a squiggly line. These are people with an unhealthy obsession. Keep your hands up and just drop it down when I hit your unhealthy obsession. It's either Taylor Swift, Tom Cruise, or occasionally open source communication. Did I, did I get you bogged up? I guess I did. I won't ask you for which one. Fortunately, this presentation does apply to uh, all groups. Good. Okay. Right. So there's an old Chinese proverb that says, tell me and I'll forget. Show me, and I might remember, but if you involve me, I'll understand. And that is the beauty of open source, isn't it? That you get to get involved uh, and get your hands on it. <laughs> and to really to communicate is to share. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of sharers. I'm sure you've all heard of Mark Spencer, the original creator of Asterisk, uh, shared that with the world and really created a whole new uh, dimension in communications. Uh, I won't go through all of the story there, I'm sure you probably know that, but if you'd like to hear more details and you haven't heard before, then do uh, catch me afterwards and I'll be happy to explain. Another sharer is Jim Dude Dixon. Woo! Yes. Let's grab a pause for Jim. Sadly, he passed away, but just in case you're unaware, Jim was the guy that back uh, in the early, sorry, in the late 90s, early 2000s, had this idea that at some stage we must be able to do what you do on a $20,000 dialogic card on the hardware in a computer, on a Pentium, well, back in those days it would be a 286386 processor. And so he was the visionary that saw that. He popped his ideas up on a bulletin board with a free BSD driver, 
Somebody said to him, you really ought to do a Linux driver. So he hacked a Linux driver together, and then he got a phone call from a guy called Mark Spencer. And, and the rest, as they say, is history. But two great sharers there. <coughs> oh, oh dear, I don't know what's going on here. Okay, yes, we're making progress. Right, okay, and that was his original card, uh, the Tormenta card. Tormenta being Spanish for a big storm, because he knew he was creating a big storm. Okay, so... Community. We're all part of a community here, and I would just say, before we move on to anything technical, that community really has three elements. Support, encouragement, and accountability. And just looking at the Asterisk project, the support comes by way of forums and other modes of interaction. Back in the day, of course, lots of people on IRC. By the way, I heard a very important piece of information a few years ago about IRC, and that is never move in with somebody you've just met on IRC. So just in case you were thinking of doing that, probably best to not The original Tinder. Yeah. <laughs> uh, encouragement, gatherings just like this, where we can get together uh, and share experiences and stories. And there's like, a picture of a, uh, a speaker who's coming up later there, Mike, on the right-hand side. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. And accountability. And this is the issue tracker that shows us what's going on in the Asterisk project, who's handling what, and so on. Okay, so just to come down to Asterisk, a little bit of history there. Project's been going since 1999, and last year we released Asterisk 15. And just as with OpenSips, the releases seem to be somewhat coincidental with an OpenSips summit. In Asterisk, the releases seem to be somewhat coincidental with an Astricon. They generally come out around the October time of year. And you can see that there's been a lot of different releases. One thing to note, and that is the transition between Asterisk 11 and 12. Although, you know, that could have passed by without too much uh, attention because it just went from 11 to 12, really, that should have been asterisk 2.0 because there was a lot of internal re-architecturing. There was the introduction of the PJ SIP stack into asterisk. There was a new bridging model. There was the RESTful interface, the ARI, the asterisk RESTful interface. So a lot of things happened there, and we've been building on that. Okay, so just, uh, well, in fact, I just told you that, didn't I? There you go. I've already uh, mentioned those things. Asterisk 14, then. What's happening in Asterisk 14? Well, we overhauled DNS, um, allowed the publishing of extension states to external SIP servers, such as Open SIPs, uh, looked at playback of uh, media from remote HTTP servers, and enhanced uh, things in general, especially around the ARI. Because what we've noticed is more and more people are using asterisk in very large scale and redundant systems with things like open SIPs, doing all the SIPing, and then using asterisk as more of a media engine or a media server. By the way, lots of great information at the wiki. wiki.asterisk.org is a great place to go. So what we've got in asterisk 15, this is the most recent release, only happened just last year, and a lot of underlying work went on to make room for future improvements and some of the very visible uh, improvements were enhancements in the area of WebRTC, much more explicit <coughs> grappling with streams than there used to be in Asterisk. We bundled PJ Project in to make life easier for people. And look at this one, this is the biggie. Video conferencing firing SFU, a selective forwarding unit. So the historical problems with video, and uh, by way of an explanation of why we went the S uh, SFU route, is that uh, it's always been quite a heavily intense thing to do on a processor video, depending on which way around you do it. Um, people like Tanberg and Polycom and those sort of folk and Cisco have come out with solutions, and a lot of them are based on MCU, the multi-party conference. The multi-party conference means, or the, the multi-point control unit, I should say, what that means is you bring all the video together your uh, MCU is responsible for putting it all together and rendering it into the lots of little blocks and then sending it out. And that's quite a processor intensive thing to do. Whereas, what we've done in Asterisk 50 is implement this SFU. It handles video better than any prior version of Asterisk. Lots of multi stream enhancements. And now ConfBridge also supports this SFU. And people say, well, what is an SFU? Well, in the case uh, of Asterisk, the SFU functionality is the same as it is in any SFU, in that all the video streams come in and then Asterisk makes it to its business 
to send out all of the individual video streams, minus your own, because you don't really need to see you, minus your own, to your endpoint. And it's then the job of the endpoint to do the rendering. And so that actually gives a lot of different advantages. One of them is that if you, as a participant, would like your own arrangements of the blocks on the screen, if you want a particular person to be bigger so you can see something they're doing or whatever, you can do that because you're not just receiving the one stream, getting what you're given, you're receiving all the individual streams and you get to do your own rendering. And uh, the great thing at the bottom is it, does, it uses much less CPU. So you can do more of them. And so it's not the case that Asterisk would end up in a bottleneck uh, in the case of a video conference. So we improve, improved the platform in many areas, lots of different things that have gone on, uh, including video and WebRTC. And I'm going to come on to the WebRTC bits in a moment, but just a few examples of the improvements that we've made in Asterisk 15. Um, uh, PJ Project bundling was uh, one of the main ones. You see, when we introduced PJ Project or PJ SIP as our new SIP stack, you had to do it manually. You had to install PJ Project first, and then you had to install Asterisk on top, and it created a few difficulties for people. And so we bundled it in to make life a lot easier. That's one of the themes, making life easier for people. Um, we've also got binaural audio support inside ConfBridge uh, and some debug utilities as well. And the WebRTC one, what happens is in the SIP configuration, there's quite a lot of different places where you'd need to do a little bit of twiddling, a little bit of tweaking in order to make uh, Asterisk run properly with WebRTC. And so what we've done is we've popped them all under a couple of simple options. So WebRTC support equals yes. And that actually sets up a lot of the things that you would have previously needed to do manually. Okay, um, added support uh, for multi-channel uh, multi audio and multi-video. And so you can see we're, we're, we're really heading along in that direction of being a media server. Um, okay, what else have we got? Uh, yes, yeah, so there'll be SFU support in ConfBridge. Okay, so one thing I need to point out, and that is previously, Asterisk 11 was an LTS, a long-term stable uh, release. Asterisk 13 was a long-term stable release. And so people expected Asterisk 15 to be a long-term stable release, and it's not. Because we put so much new and exciting stuff in, there was just too much to release it as an LTS. And so it's out there, and people are using it. I've, I've got it working on a Raspberry Pi, did a WebRTC video conference on. And uh, just to give you the full stats, after about four and a half conference participants, it started to go a bit funny, uh, the old Raspberry Pi, but I'm working on that. Um, and uh, so we're, we're going to flesh out the uh, SFU APIs, going to do some more work on improving video resilience in poor network conditions, and continue with the PJ SIP stuff as well. And so Asterisk 16 will end up being an LTS long-term stable uh, uh, release. And we would expect Asterisk 16 to be out around October time when we come to do um, Asterisk on, and I'll, I'll give you more information about that a little bit later. Now, contribution stats for Asterisk 15, it's not just Digium doing this, it's an open source project, and we're very, very blessed to have a lot of con uh, contributors in the community. And there is just uh, an example of a few of them. Uh, some of the commits that we've got from outside of Digium. You can see people like Sean, Bright and Corey have been uh, contributing very, very well. And uh, most of these folk tend to show up at Astricon uh, to talk about these things. Okay, so Asterisk uh, 11 has gone into security fix only. That was a very popular long-term stable release. Lots of people are using it, but that is at the end of its supported life now. <coughs> Asterisk 15 will not be an LTS. And just for those of you that are sat there thinking, hmm, well, I would like to use an LTS for my releases, what am I going to do? Well, we've extended the life of Asterisk 13 as an LTS, so that's got longer supported time. And then Asterisk 16 should get us back on track with being an LTS. Okay, so Asterisk is keeping up with changes in technology, like WebRTC, <coughs> Internet of Things, all that kind of stuff, but also keeping up with changes in the behaviour and the way that people are using Asterisk. You know, back in the day, Asterisk was the solution. You know, people wanted a PBX and maybe 
made of PDXL asterisk. However, we're seeing more and more asterisk being used as a component, along with things like open SIPs in much larger systems, and so we're reacting to that. Okay, I would encourage you to go to the asterisk wiki. We vastly improved it several years ago by putting content in it. And it's absolutely excellent. There is lots and lots of great stuff in there. Very often I'll be fiddling about, I'm, I'm based in the UK, uh, and of course Digium is over there in the US, and very often of course I'm, I'm blessed to have a hotline to the development team, and every now and again I'll ask a question, and I'll get back a response, which is always very gracious, but it usually points me to a page in the wiki that explains exactly what I was asking. So there is a lot of good stuff in the wiki for, for you to see there. Okay, so, some years ago, I cracked out a presentation called Ast Asterisk Mythbusters, because too many people were believing strange myths about Asterisk, and so, this uh, is actually some slides borrowed from that presentation, but I've found that they're still very relevant because not, uh, not everybody understands uh, the transformation that has occurred in the Asterisk project over recent years. And there was a few myths that I was trying to bust at the time, but I want to concentrate on a couple of them. The first one is Asterisk does not scale for high core volumes. That was a bit of a myth. People used to say, oh, well, Asterisk is really only good for a couple of hundred cores or something like that. Uh, and of course that that's, uh, may have been true in the old, 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 old days. However, things have moved along. And really it depends on what you think high core volumes are. You know, some people back in the day would have said, oh, I don't want to put any more than three or four hundred cores on a box. But just to give you an idea, at Astricon, a gauntlet was thrown down some years ago. Who can get the most uh, calls on a single asterisk box? So not a cluster of boxes, just the one asterisk server. Who can get the most calls with media on the box? Any ideas for what somebody achieved with that? I do have some asterisk stickers to give away. Yes, sir. Oh, I just have an idea of, uh, of a test, uh, testing uh, asterisk myself. Right. Uh, it's about uh, uh, around 3,000 calls. 3,000 calls from a gentleman there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you one of our all new asterisk stickers. <laughs> These are limited edition ones that are so small they fit on mobile phones. They're that good. There you go. In fact, have a few. So, three and a half thousand. Any other guesses from anybody else? Yeah. Yes, sir. Three thousand dollars in a hundred dollars. <laughs> we'll have to give Flavio some. And Flavio, by the way, did an excellent presentation <coughs> comparing PJ SIP with Chan SIP in Asterisk. Very popular presentation last year at Astricon, and now available on video, I believe. Uh, and if you want to, he'll sign the video for you. You just have to take your mobile phone over. Do that. Okay, so here's the real answer. 11,500 calls on a single asterisk box. Now that was from a community member called Ulle Johansson, who some of you uh, may have come across. And the only reason it stopped at 11,500 was not asterisk, it was because he filled up his gigabit ethernet with audio, because he was just doing G711A <coughs> law New York. So, there's quite a few calls that you can do on asterisk. Nobody is suggesting, of course, that you do 11,500 calls on a single box, but that was uh, a good indicator. Okay, and of course you can see that you can build out asterisk as much as you want, using open SIPs there as a dispatcher for as many asterisk servers as you want. Okay, here's another example. This is a company that I worked with in the Philippines. This is on good old-fashioned E1s, connecting up uh, using SS7 signaling to a mobile network. This particular box is handling 56 million calls a week in the Philippines, which is a reasonable amount. That's 8 million calls a day that they're dealing with over there. When I started working with them, it was 42 million calls, but they, they upped it a little bit. And so Asterisk is being used in very large scale environments. The city of Amsterdam, where we are right now, as a municipality, has 23,000 endpoints connected to Asterisk. Um, over in the US, University of Texas has got 10,000 users just for voicemail. Um, is this being videoed? In that case, I have to keep my voice down. In the UK, British Telecom, who, who would claim they don't do a lot of asterisk, over 50,000 voicemail boxes on asterisk because they didn't want to pay the CCM licensing fees. Uh, very strange. Okay, and uh, over in KL, there's a KL-based company that created a system for 130,000 US military users supporting 10,000 calls at a time. And so Asterisk is finding its way into pretty large-scale systems. Okay, so all of those Asterisk myths 
and you can see I didn't touch on some of those, um, but all of those were officially busted many, many years ago. Okay, so asterisk fosters growth. Asterisk has been involved in the growth of communications for many years. I don't think it's any coincidence that asterisk came out in 1999, early 2000s, and SIP got adopted around that sort of time scale as well. I wouldn't say asterisk is solely responsible, but having a free toolkit with which you can play with SIP was probably a useful thing in those days. And you can see that partnering with <coughs> projects like Open SIPs, like Homer, people deploying with Docker means that people are expanding the bounds all the time. Now, I do want to have a quick word about supporting your local open source project. Not just Digium, uh, in terms of uh, commercial support and commercial products around Asterisk, but also open SIP solutions and things like that. Around, you, know, you need to support the project, that's, support the goose that's laying the golden eggs. And one of the examples is, in the world of Asterisk, Digim have been doing phones for some time, and everybody loves our phones, but they tell us they're a bit expensive, because in certain geographies and for certain jobs, people are working on a budget, uh, and the Digim phones are like the Rolls-Royce experience of phones. In fact, this particular one here is entirely touch screen, the D80, not a single button on it, uh, and it's a beautiful user experience, but not everybody wants to pay $300 plus for a, per endpoint. So, just recently, just in February this year, we came out with a budget-friendly bunch of phones. Um, this one that I'm holding up here is a beautiful one, and it has an end-user price of $59. And it has a beautiful little asterisk logo on it. Not a Digi logo, an asterisk logo on it. And uh, I'm going to give this to Celeste to put into the lucky drawer at the end, so somebody could walk away with $59 worth of phone. How about that? I'll uh, be happy to hold that for you. <laughs> uh, these, these, are, um, these are full colour screens. Every single phone, even the $59 phone, has a colour screen. I'll let you look after it, Alex, because I trust you implicitly. Sure you do. <laughs> okay, so if you're wondering about the phones, there are the phones. They're called the A range. The traditional um, range of Digium phones was called the D range for Digium. New range is called the A range for asterisk, and even the top of the range A phone, six line registrations, gigabit, 4.3 inch color display, that's only about 130 bucks as, a, as an end user price. So <laughs> you can see it's a very, very budget friendly range of phones. There. They came out in February and they've already been very, very successful indeed. Okay, so let's just remember this by the way, that we're all on the same side. Whether you're an open SIPs person or a Camellio person, whether you're an asterisk person or a free switch person, whatever you are, we're all part of something a lot bigger, which is the open source community. And uh, I think it pays us to remember that and to be very thankful for, for all the people that have contributed to that. Okay, I'd like to encourage you to come to Astricon, that's our global gathering. That happens over in Florida this year, um, 9th to 11th of October. There'll be somewhere between six and 800 open source geeky types uh, for you to liaise with. And we still have our call for speakers open. Hey, Celeste, listen, when you walk past hey, that phone, hey. can you take it away before Alex? Hey. <laughs> what the heck? Um, yeah, we've got a lot of people. Celeste will be there, I hope. And I know yeah, you, you need to save it. it. I just, you know, just make sure Alex doesn't. Yeah, it's yeah, making it's sure exactly Alex just doesn't disappear. It. <laughs> Uh, Bob then will be there. All, all the uh, important open source folk, uh, and of course, when I say that, I don't just mean project leaders, I mean, you know, everybody. Six to eight hundred people uh, are going to be at Astricon. And the, the call for speakers is still open. It doesn't close for a few weeks yet, so there's still an opportunity to get a uh, speaking idea in. Okay, so I want to finish with a quote. Mark Twain said, to do good is noble, but to tell others to do good is even nobler and much less trouble. So thank you very, very much. Do keep sharing. Thank you, David. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for David? There's a question over there, the man in the hat of the previous presenter there. Uh, yeah, I was curious about the SFU support for different types of uh, what, spatial or temporal scaling. Uh, and then also, do you do any type of RTCP bandwidth estimation along with that? That is a question I cannot answer. Okay. However, if I just put you back here, and you just jot down my email address, 
send it to me please and I'll ask somebody that really knows the answer. Okay, I'm, I'm old enough to realise that it's much better to find the right answer rather than to give some strange, uh, undesirable answer on the fly. Okay, appreciate Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yes sir. Oh, Alex, just here. Tell me. Who was it? It's this gentleman here. Isn't it great to see Alex doing some running around? That's pretty good, isn't it? Do you think I keep my girl's finger? Yeah, she wants me to take some away. Did you expect to retire Jamsi? Sorry, sir, I didn't hear that. Did you expect to retire Jamsi on a six? Do we expect Jamsi to go redundant? Is that the question? Oh, retire. Okay. So there's no plans to um, just unilaterally retire Chancet. It's still in there, it's still in asterisk 15, it will be in asterisk 16, and we'll leave it there until everybody has moved over and there's just no need for it. So we're, we're not going to kind of force the issue. Uh, right now there are no plans to just cut it off. Um, however, what I would say is there's no active development going on in Chancet. All the future is PJC. Does that answer your question? Yeah, because we found there's a uh, fire district leak in even in district 30, which is not uh, on PJC, on the same setup. Right. So, but there, yeah, there are people are finding some compatibility issues, and and also people are really realizing how blessed they were using Chansip in terms of ease of use, because PJSIP is more sophisticated and therefore a little bit more complex to set up. But once you've actually got it set up and working nicely, it's a worthwhile exercise. Is that it for the questions, uh, Alex? Have we got to move on? I believe on? that's all the time we have. Okay, thank you very, very much. One more round of applause for Dave. <laughs> if you need a sticker, come and see me. He's also got duct tape with the Astros logo on it, too. <laughs> oh, thank you.